know, in a lot of ways, he's, he's just like a, the, the kid that he once was, you know, he's young at heart. Uh, in other ways, he's tired, you know, from what he's gone through. Hopefully I'm that little beacon that can show people uh, the way to get out of the abyss, to get out of the, the shadows. This is a story that goes on forever. It touches you at your deepest level. I was a pretty smart kid, uh, thanks to my mother. People used to tell other kids that you should be like Mrs. Artis's son. He's so polite. So I went on to star through my high school career as a football player, a basketball player, and running track. And that was my dream, that was my goal, to be the very first one in my family to, to get a, a college degree. He led a good life, and he was now reaching the point where he was trying to figure out what to do next. And he was 19 years old when he got plucked out of the, not even the prime of his life, just getting into the prime of his life. And that was just uh, snatched from him. I met Reuben Carter the second year after I graduated from high school. Reuben was a high-profile figure. He was a well-known boxer. He was a, he was a good boxer, if not great. I was the number one contender for the middleweight crowd. I was a so-called celebrity. His nickname, Hurricane, was because of the flurry of punches that he threw. He threw them like a hurricane. John and I lived in the same hometown of Patterson, New Jersey. I had no idea about John Artis before June 17th, 1966. It was about closing time. I was getting ready to go home because I had no more money. And as I was going out the door, I saw John. And I said, John, I'm going home. You want to go with me? So John said, yeah. And I'm sitting at a traffic light, uh, waiting for it to change. And I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and, and, and suddenly, the intersection was filled with police cars. All the cars, and police cars in Patterson filled that intersection and surrounded the car. In June 1966, three men were shot dead in this bar in Patterson, New Jersey. Allegedly, uh, two uh, African-American men burst into a uh, bar. There were all these people who were shot up. The cops started stopping white cars looking for two black men. They knew me. They knew that I wasn't a violent person, had never been in trouble like that. They were given a lie detector test. They passed the test and they were released. And for the rest of the summer of 1966, nothing until October 14th the eve of my 20th birthday. Headline banner, mystery witness in the Lafayette Bar and Grill murders was being housed at a hotel in Patterson. And the door burst open and these police officers ran in, putting the shotguns in my face, pistols under my, under my chin. And they told me that you're under arrest. And I said, for what? They said, murder. I was being arrested for the Lafayette Bar and Grill shootings and murders. And the last thing I saw was my father looking out the kitchen window watching them put me into a police car. They were going to seek the death penalty. These people were going to try and kill me for something I didn't do. They weren't looking for justice. They were looking for convictions. And that causes you to doctor your thinking, and you begin to look at evidence in a different light. How are you going to prove something that doesn't exist? Uh, how, how can you do that? That's when the first time during the trial, I get to see Bello, the star, the star witness, this mystery witness, Bello, Alfred Bello. And, and they asked him, do you see the people in this courtroom that you saw that night? He says, yes, and he just turned. I said, yeah, him, him. And I want to yell it at the top of my lungs. That's a lie. And that's when I got a strong sinking feeling that this is that time my mother was talking about, that trouble is easy to get into and hard to get out of. Will the defendants please rise? 
That's the most afraid I've ever been in my life. I thought my heart was gonna beat out of my chest. It, it, was, it was beating so hard and so fast. We, the jury, find the defendants guilty on all charges. They, I mean, they literally tried to kill him. They put him, he was on trial for his life. And he came real close to getting a death penalty. On the testimony of Bello and another man, Carter and his companion were sent to prison for life. Uh, the whole process, the criminal process in this case, was perverted. Because I knew that I hadn't done anything. And being with Ruben, I knew he didn't do anything. And so I felt that just a matter of telling the truth would be the end of it. When it slammed, it made me jump. And I felt the reverberation in my body from the finality of it. And it was the, the most uh, alone and forlorn I've ever felt in my life. And God only knew what was gonna happen before I got out of there. And you never relax. The only time you can let your guard down is when you knew everybody else in the building was in their cell and asleep. But the day you relax is the day you die. The nuclei was the fact that I knew I was innocent. That was a burning, for, that was a volcano that kept me getting up every day and going to bed every night. They asked him every year that he was in prison, they would ask him, you give us a statement that would incriminate Carter and we will guarantee you that you'll be home before the sun goes down. And every time, John would say, my mother and father didn't teach me to lie. They taught me to tell the truth. Really, no one that knew John thought him to be a triple murderer. He had been involved in a prison uprising and had been responsible for ensuring that a group of guards uh, were freed. This, this man is not a killer. After nearly 10 years, uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song which was called The Story of the Hurricane, which started a whole lot of notoriety around the case. We got a whole lot of support from people. The publicity took off, and it opened the law, opened the prison's door. This publicity, this high-profile thing, it opened the door. So there's a big movement and uh, a lot of people were really, really putting a lot of pressure on to reinvestigate the case. Heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, who had lent his name and given a good deal of his money to the long effort to get the two men out of prison. Everything was going to come out right, and we believed that. I told Ruben and I told John the motion for the new trial had given us the key that was going to unlock the prison door for them. The two witnesses who were instrumental in, in causing the conviction had now recanted. The lie wasn't on my part. I told them I seen two black males. It was suggested, more or less. You could go through the case piece by piece by piece by piece and show that each piece of evidence was worthless. So I had a second trial. It lasted six weeks. The jury deliberated for nine hours. I was re-convicted, re-sentenced, and re-sent back to prison. This was a horrible miscarriage of justice. We were going to fight this forever if it had to be done. I'm getting up there now. I'm, I'm, I'm going close to my mid-30s. And all my 20s are gone now, so. My time rolled up, and it's time for me to go to the parole board. She said, Mr. Artis, we have decided to give you parole on December 22nd. Well, that was enough to, to break the emotional bounds that I had held inside of me, and the floodgates opened, and I started crying. He just came walking through the door and had that little paper bag in his hand, and that was it. And the biggest grin on his face you can imagine. The, the goal was to clear my, my name so that I got my family respect back. The case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed it on the issue of prosecutorial misconduct and you were holding evidence in racial revenge. We just, uh, you know, jumped up and down for joy, called John, he was thrilled. Uh, it was, uh, you know, very, very exciting. So technically, I never served 15 years in prison, technically. Technically, I never had two trials. 
The only thing that technically occurred is that I was arrested in, on October 14, 1966, and 22 years later, the charges were dismissed. He is now a human being who's presumed innocent of any crime. And now he's in Virginia, he's working with youthful offenders. He's given back to a society that has done nothing but take from him, which is very, very admirable. As my parents prepared me for the world as best they could, I'm trying to prepare these kids for the world as best I can. I try to take these kids under my wing and protect them. John Artis is still in a position to help people. I think John's legacy is don't give up. Believe in yourself and never give up. Everybody who lives dies, but not everybody who dies has lived. And you have to make the most of the time that you have while you're here, because you don't get any more time.